right. It's good to see you guys today. Thank you for coming out, and and I hope you again will enjoy the subject matter that we're talking about. You know, the timeline as the things happen in the Bible for the end times. And last Sunday night, we actually got to put our first. Uh, piece of paper up on on the timeline and we determined that there's a seven year period it's given to us in the book of Daniel in chapter 9 there's a prophecy that's involved uh, it's Daniel's you know 70 weeks and we've learned that there's certain things happen in that that time period it talks about seven weeks there's going to be the street build again and they're going to build up Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince but in uh, three score and two weeks you know Messiah is going to be cut off and then it talks about you know this final seven years week uh, final seven uh, final seven years or one week there's going to be a situation where the there's a covenant that's going to be made and it talked about in the midst of the week you know there's going to be this abomination of desolation and so what we're going to do is we're going to support and we're going to find in scripture more places where it talks about the abomination of desolation and I want you guys to pay attention to um, the things that happen that are associated with the abomination of desolation we're going to look for different characteristics and see what comes before and what become what comes after and uh, we're going to start today by reading in Daniel chapter 8 and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 27 book of Daniel alrighty so it says in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar a vision appeared unto me even unto me Daniel after that which appeared unto me at the first and I saw in a vision and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace which is in the province of Elam and I saw in a vision and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold there stood before the river a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high but one was higher than the other and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. For it came for, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. 
and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking to another saint, said unto the certain saint, saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under, unto, underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass that I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a voice, a man's voice, between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O man. For at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the, la in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. But he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity again to be in, in your house. Lord, I pray that you uh, be with the church, help it to grow, and uh, Lord, tonight just help us to have, you know, some of the understanding that Daniel lacked, because Daniel, you know, he didn't have the book of Revelation to help us understand these things. He didn't have any of the New Testament, and Lord, you've given us your word, and it's a great gift, and, and this word is exciting. And, uh, and I thank you so much for it. And help, help us to understand and help me to preach it and uh, be able to explain it to the best of my ability. And I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a, a part of the a passage that I really want us to focus on. And it says, And in the latter time of the kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall rise up or shall stand up. So um, just the verses, the, the next few verses that come after this part and this one included, you know, it, it's really a summary of this whole seven year period that I'm talking about. We have a king of fierce countenance who understands dark sentences. So that that, that description there should give us a light that this is a dark individual. Somebody who's, you know, you could describe as, you know, and when you think of understanding dark sentences, you think of witchcraft, right? You think about the power of darkness. And it, it talks about how his power is going to be mighty. 
but not by his own power. So if you uh, read, and we're going to look at some verses in the book of Revelation, and, and if you read Revelation chapter 13, which is really all about the abomination of desolation, you're going to understand that it's the dragon or Satan that gives the Antichrist or the beast his power. So here, when it's giving you the summary in Daniel chapter 8, it says he's going to be mighty, but it's not by his own power. You know, he gets his power from Satan. But, and he's going to destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And if you recall when we looked and we was comparing all of the New Testament scriptures that brought up, you know, uh, the abomination of desolation as described by Daniel the prophet, you know, it, it, if, you look, if you listen to the surrounding things, it, ha it talked about how the gospel was going to be preached to all nations, and, you know, that, that some of you are going to be put to death, you know. And so that's being talked about here as well. And it talks about, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. So the things that lead up to the rise of the Antichrist, you know, uh, we're going to look at some scriptures, but there's going to be lots of wars, there's going to be famines, and things like that are going to be talked about. And, um, and that's going to cause the economy to tank. Uh, it's going to cause the world to be really hurting. But when you read through the book of Revelation chapter 13, you'll find out that he's going to uh, actually have a new system to where you have to take a mark in order to buy or sell. And I think that that is going to, you know, how he's going to cause his, you know, craft to prosper again. Because he's going to start a whole new economy. One that's not based on, you know, um, using cash, but he's going to control every means of production. Okay. Um, anyway, the point that, that I want us to pay attention to here is that it says he's going to magnify himself in his heart. And by peace, he's going to destroy many. And here at the very end, it says, and he's going to stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And that is going to be something that happens at the end of the battle of Armageddon. Jesus is going to come at, you know, on a white horse. You've probably read about it. And, you know, it says the sword's going to come out of his mouth and like everybody's just going to die and he's going to cast the beast and the false prophet into a lake of fire. So, you know, this this antichrist, this man of sin, this uh, person who is a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences is going to be broken without hand. And so, um, but uh, the things that we're going to look for that kind of surrounds the abomination of desolation, one of them here is it kind of just uh, talked about it, a little snippet, that he's going to magnify himself. So uh, the next uh, part of the book of Daniel, if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 11, we're going to look at verses uh, 20 through 38. But before we do that, I want to talk about the greatness of the Bible. So while you guys are turning there and we go to the next part, I just want to take an opportunity to talk about how great the Bible is and give you a, a clear warning about so-called Bible scholars. So uh, as we're reading through Daniel chapter 8, I just want to talk a little bit about the vision that he had. The vision involved a ram and a he-goat. And you had a ram with two horns. And then the he-goat rushes at the ram and, and just quickly destroys him. And the ram had one notable, I'm sorry, the he-goat had one notable horn. And, um, and this is really an amazing, amazing vision. And, um, and he actually gets from, you know, the angel Gabriel gives him a explanation of what the vision represented. And it tells us that, hey, that, that ram with, you know, two horns where one was greater than the other, they represent the kings of Media and Persia. So this ram represents an empire. You know, the Medes and the Persians. 
And, but somebody else, some other empire is going to come and it's going to subdue it. And it's a uh, animal, a he-goat that represents the king of Grisha and it's represented by a notable horn. And so I just want to, I want to read a little bit of just modern history. And we're going to talk just a, just a hair about um, Alexander the Great. And uh, so I'd kind of look this up real quick. All righty, so uh, this is a snippet from a history website, um, and it's about the invasion of the Persian Am Empire by Alexander the Great. And it says, uh, talking about Alexander the Great, he was now in a position to take up the task which his father, whose name was Philip, was about to begin at the time of his death. In 334 BC, Alexander invaded Asia Minor. He had with him an army of some 40,000 men made up of Macedonians, troops plus contingents sent from Greek, Thracian, and Illyrian states under Macedonian rule. There were also some mercenaries. The army crossed the Hellespont, the narrow strip of water between Europe and Asia Minor, and marched north to meet an army which the local Persian governors were gathering with which to defend the empire. The two forces met on the banks of the river Granicus. Alexander's was, much, uh, was a much larger army, but the Persian army of some 25,000 men was in good defensive position. Awaiting Alexander's attack, in the ensuing battle, Alexander showed his aggression by attacking the enemy head on and his mastery uh, generalship by a series of feints which caught the enemy off balance and led to their rout. The Persians lost some 6,000 men that day, killed or captured, while Alexander lost about 400 men. So, um, Alexander then marched his army southward along the coast of Asia Minor. He met stout resistance at the city of, uh, I can't pronounce this one right, Halicarnassus. But after a four-month siege and some demoralizing setbacks, some of his troops were able to make a breach in the city walls, allowing his army to enter and take the city. So, uh, you know, it talks here about how, you know, it kind of lines up with the Bible about how this, this uh, he-goat moved with collar and just swiftly takes out the Persian Empire. And I remember back when I was going to a Baptist church in Aberdeen, Ohio, Riverview Baptist Church, you know, uh, a lot of times you'd have a service, like question and answer services and stuff like that, and I always enjoyed them. And, uh, and I remember, like, the discussion was, you know, do, do we know of any, like, Bible prophecies that have come true in our day, or, you know, you know are we still just all looking forward to the future? And, you know, this is kind of amazing because, you know, here um, Daniel is, he is still in the middle of the Persian Empire. It talks about in the beginning of here in, in, in Daniel that he's at Shushan the palace. This would be the same palace that the book, book of Esther is written in, you know. And, uh, and that's a really good book, you know. And so you can kind of gather that this is way before the Greek Empire is even conceived. And here the Bible is telling us about Alexander the Great. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to not notice it, right? And Alexander uh, the Great, he died young, I believe like 33. And, you know, uh, and so his little horn, the little horn, or that notable horn was broken off, and out of it four came up, right? That's what's in the vision in, in Daniel chapter 9. So now, after saying all that, um, you've got Bible scholars out there. And uh, it, it kind of, uh, you know, as I was reading about this, it sparked my interest, and I, I asked the question, when do people think the book of Daniel was written. 
Well, you know, they're self-dating in the Bible. I mean, Daniel said, I had this vision while I was at Shushan the palace. But listen to what people actually say that are so-called Bible scholars. So, um, I want to get my bearings here. Okay, during the Enlightenment, when liberal scholars began to question the dating and authorship of dozens of Old and New Testament books that began to change, since the early 1800s, uh, Porphyry's position uh, became the basis of the German literary critical movement's dating, spreading the theory far and wide so that by the mid-20th century, this was the dominant scholarly position. They didn't believe the, that accurate prophecy of the future was possible. Their view was that the Hebrew prophets were forth-tellers and not foretellers. Uh, through a, or though a careful study of the prophets shows that this is a clear river statement. However, it is only fair to say that some respected evangelical scholars such as uh, Golding J, F.F. F. Bruce, N.T. Wright also hold a late dating. So here are the reasons that people come up with why you can't trust that Daniel, or that this book was like written by Daniel at the time that he did it, and they believe that it was actually written after, you know, the Greeks would have conquered the Persian army. It says uh, Daniel contains historical inaccuracies concerning 6th century kings and events. Uh, Daniel contains Greek words that wouldn't have been possible if it had been written in the 6th century. Uh, Daniel's predictions of the future are too accurate. You guys get that? It's too accurate. God is too accurate. And... Um, uh, to be authentic prophecy. Therefore, they must have been written after the fact. So my warning is to, uh, if you want to be a Bible scholar, do not read books about the Bible. Just read the Bible. Amen. Right? So uh, I just wanted to share that with you since that was some, you know, something that piqued my interest when I was studying that. But now that we've... Uh, uh, you guys should be at Daniel chapter 11. We're going to read through verses uh, 11, 20 through 38. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtained a kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. So the first thing I, got, I want you guys to notice about the beginning of this passage is that there's a talk of a league, which is the same as a covenant. Those words are being in interchangeably, right? If I make a league with somebody, it's an agreement. An agreement is also a covenant. And if you remember in Daniel uh, chapter 9, when we talked about the 70th, 70 weeks prophecy, it talks about in that final week, you know, there's going to be a covenant made with many. And here it's going to talk about how the Antichrist is going to use the seat. And there's warnings in the New Testament when you're talking about the Antichrist. The warning is always, be not deceived. And there's a reason. It's because there's going to be loads of deception. I'd say today, everything you get from mainstream news, it's deception. You know, I mean, there's got to be a little bit of truth mixed in. But, you know, their points, the things that are going to get you to try to be swayed is, is probably de deception. Okay, um, so he's going to be working deceitfully when the Antichrist starts. You know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. It says, he shall enter peaceably 
even unto the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the, uh, the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So just a, a quick note that there's a lot of war that's being described here. You know, the king of the south is going to be casting foreca or forecasting devices against the Antichrist and vice versa. And so um, and just another interesting facet about the Bible and language is that, you know, guns, missiles, weapons, those words, I mean, the, when we're talking about a, a, a gun, um, a machine gun, things that we use in modern warfare today, there was no words like that in the English language when the Bible was written. And so the Bible talks about forecasting devices and I think it's a great use of a limited English language. And so when I, when I read that, I conjure up, you know, if this is talking about something that would have been happening in, in the biblical times, you're thinking of catapults, right? You know, forecasting devices, you're thinking of rocks and different things. But if you're gonna put this at the end times, I mean, what else could it be other than maybe nuclear warheads or other types of missiles? And um, so I, I just think that's interesting. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper, for the, for the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his hand with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. And at the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the chip, ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part. You know, that's going to be short for armies. So arms shall stand on his part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And they shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall replace the abomination that maketh desolate. So there's our kind of key marker that puts us in that timeline of the abomination of desolation. So leading up to this point, I just want you to note that the things that happened is that, you know, we learned in Daniel chapter 8 that a uh, king of fierce count countenance is going to come up. And here it's telling us that he's going to be using deception and he's going to work deceitfully and, you know, he's going to enter peaceably and he's going to conquer, you know, and there's going to be lots and lots of war. Uh, and so those are the things that kind of lead up to him having indignation against the Holy Covenant and he's going to take away the daily sacrifice and he's going to place or set up the abomination that maketh desolate. There's going to be arms that stand on his part. If you recall in uh, the book of Luke when we was reading there in 21, you know, um, in, in all of the other accounts in the Gospels that kind of talked about how, um, you know, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation as spoken by Daniel the prophet, get out of there, run, you know, make haste. Uh, but in Luke it said when you see, arm, you know, when you see armies compassed about Jerusalem, so there's, there's more than one aspect, and, and so the arms is going to stand on his part. When that abomination is set up, you know, that's going to be the same time that Jerusalem is going to be made desolate. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, um, so let's continue reading. Um, it says, uh, after he places the abomination that make desolate, and it says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, 
shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they, they shall be helping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So also in the Gospels, if you recall, um, when it talks about that abomination of desolation, it also talks about at that time that the gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world. And here you can see that being described as that many with understanding are going to instruct others. And it's going, in that instruction, it's saying, uh, let's see, I'm going to get my bearings here. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end. So, you know, people are going to be instructing people in righteousness. They're going to be getting people saved. And, and, and it's just simplified to the phrase in the New Testament that the gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world during that period of time. And that's, uh, that's important, you know. We need to get the gospel out. And it's kind of even given me a thought. You know, because uh, when we go soul winning, usually we knock on the door and we uh, tell them, you know, where we're from. And, and we say, you know, uh, we're with Good News Baptist Church. Do you go to church? And, uh, and I've been wondering and thinking about how real the end times are. And you can kind of see certain things that are, that are happening today. You know, uh, you're talking about people being forced to take a vaccine so they can enter into the restaurant. And then you kind of compare that with a time in the future where, you know, you're not even going to be able to buy or sell unless you take a mark. And you can see things kind of gearing up. And you see that there's globalism and, 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 and everything's just kind of like, you know, God destroyed the temple of Babel because he didn't want everybody being just one people. But we're, we're, you know, I can talk to anybody from anywhere now. And as long as I speak their language, right? So, you know, you can just see that we're kind of like that, getting close to this one world government. That's all I'm trying to say. And the point being is that if there's a way to make the end times real, it could be a way in the door to get to the gospel. And it kind of is interesting that the gospel is going to be preached because I think people kind of are going to realize that you can see the things that are happening in prophecy happening today. Okay, so um, we'll keep reading. It says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall we regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So the next major um, trait that is associated with the abomination of desolation is this magnification of himself. He's going to magnify himself above every, you know, above any God. And... Uh, and I want, want you guys to see that in another place. So when we, when we read this about him magnifying himself, I want you to think of blasphemy. You know, uh, it talks about how, you know, this person is also going to be a blasphemer. And really what we read is a definition of, of blasphemy. I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with me. Okay. 
I want to just start here in verse 3. Um, has everybody made it to Second Thessalonians? It says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. So Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about, you know, the end time events. And he actually gives a little bit of a timeline that, um, that something is going to happen. You know, hey, let no man deceive you. Um, that this day is not going to come, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that day is that's going to come, but before whatever that day is comes, there's going to be a falling away first. And then the man of sin is going to be revealed, and then he goes on to describe how the man of sin is going to be revealed, and it's that he's going to exalt himself above all that is called God. And that is associated with the events that happen at the abomination of desolation. You guys uh, get the connection there? Okay. <clears throat> so, I, I want to take a little bit of time to kind of talk about the falling away. Because it says there's going to be a falling away first. Um, if you guys haven't, like, left your place, you can probably remember it because we just read through uh, the book of Daniel uh, chapter 8 there. It says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So it says that's not going to happen until the transgressors are going to come to the full. In 2 Thessalonians, it says the Antichrist can't be revealed until there's a falling away first. Can you guys see a connection between transgressors coming to the full and a falling away kind of being the same thing? And you kind of touched on it when you're, you're, you're talking about prayer tonight and you're talking about how, um, you know, our churches, there aren't, aren't full today. And, and people are dying in these churches and there's no young people. And this is what is, I think, characteristic of the great falling away. And it's, it's people who have good morals. They may not even be saved, but if, if, you know, and back in the 50s and the 60s, 70s, 80s, you had a lot of people that at least had a good moral compass. And, and those people are falling away, but their children have not learned what they've learned. And they've been deceived. And now we see things like, you know, gay marriage. You know, think about, could gay marriage be accepted by the United States Supreme Court, um, you know, in the 1980s? And the answer is no. Nobody would have ever thought or allowed that to happen. But because times change and things fall away then that can happen. So the point is that this man uh, uh, with a fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences, he's not going to be able to like, be able to deceive the people unless the people are willing to be deceived first. Does that, does that make sense? And that's what we kind of see happening today. And um, <clears throat> so let's continue reading in Daniel chapter 8 or chapter 12. Because um, it's going to kind of continue on. And, um, and it says, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
And they that shall be wise, or they that, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal up the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things should be finished. So that time, times, and a half a time is a time represents a full year. And, um, and then a times is plural, represents two. So time, times, and then a half a time, you're going to get three and a half years. And so, um, you know, I was uh, first, I think the very first message on the end times, I was trying to give an explanation that a week of, you know, in Daniel's 70th week, the prophecy there is, um, you know, each one of those weeks represents a seven-year period. And, and this is another support of that because usually you have something that marks a center, the midpoint, and then it's going to be finished in three and a half years. Or oftentimes you'll see it said as 1260 days or um, 42 months. Those are the, going to be the things. And all of those equal, you know, uh, three and a half years. Um, based on a 360 60 day calendar, 30 day months. That would have been what the Hebrews did. The, you know, when, when God created man, you know, he told us that the sun, the moon, and the stars, they're going to be for times and seasons and so forth. And so at the beginning of the new moon, you know, they would blow the trumpet to signify the new month and and the moon cycles are 30 days. Does, does that make sense to everybody? So we're talking about a 360 degree, or I'm sorry, 360 day year. Now time is kind of uh, spent and, um, and I'm always itching to add stuff to the timeline. So um, what I want to do is, uh, you know, just talk about what happens at the abomination of desolation and I, I kind of wanted to focus on that magnifying himself he's going to set up this abomination that maketh desolate and then he's going to magnify himself above all that is called God so at the abomination of desolation we are going to uh, put here that that's when the antichrist is going to be is going to demand to be worshipped. And now uh, I see that it's a little past seven, so I think it's a, a place that, uh, you know, I wish I would have got further along, and, uh, but I'm going to have to pick up where I left off, and, but soon we're going to be talking about the things that are going to happen before and after, and at some point I'm going to quit going <laughs> into a lot of the detail that I'm talking about because I'm realizing that the details really take a long time. So. Um, but uh, I, I thank you guys for, 